And if you are joining us early for the meeting, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Harris County Flood Control District's virtual community engagement meeting to discuss multiple basins in the Little Cypress Creek watershed as part of the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. This virtual community meeting is being offered by the Flood Control District to continue to share vital information with the community during this period when in-person public meetings have been suspended due to the co concerns with the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Shelder Brigham. I'm with the Flood Control District's communications team. I'm joined tonight by a team of Flood Control District leadership and subject matter experts to ensure we continue to keep the community up to date on important flood mitigation projects in your community. We're also joined by staff from area elected officials, offices, and community associations. Welcome. We are also glad to see the community so engaged in this project. And I do wanna give a special welcome to those of you who are repeat participants and joined us in November of 2018 for our first community engagement meeting about the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. We look forward to continuing to share updates and keeping you all in the community involved. This virtual public meeting will begin with a presentation to share project updates, including the construction schedule and other important information for the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. The presentation will be followed by a virtual Q&A and uh, with Flood Control District team members. Attendees will be able to submit comments and questions through the website or by phone. Any comments not addressed during the Q&A session will receive a response from the Flood Control District after the event. Instructions on how to participate in the virtual open house are included on the slides on this virtual meeting webpage and the Flood Control District website. 
I will also share a reminder about these instructions when we reach the end of the Q&A portion. We will now transition to Marcus Stuckett. He is our Flood Control District Engineering Division Director. He's going to share information about the district and this project. Marcus, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sheldra, and a special thank you to each of you for joining us tonight. Uh, in this presentation, we'll give you a brief overview of uh, four stormwater detention basins, which are located in the Little Cypress Creek watershed. <clears throat> but before we get to those projects, uh, I want to share some information about the Harris County Flood Control District. So the Harris County Flood Control District, we are a special purpose district that was created in 1937 in response to floods that devastated the Houston area in 1929 and 1935. Uh, the Flood Control District was created to serve as a local partner to leverage federal funding for flood damage reduction projects. And our mission has greatly, over, uh, greatly expanded over, eight, over the past 80 years with billions of dollars of infrastructure improvements in the ground. And while we are a separate entity from Harris County, the Harris County Commissioner's Court serves as our governing body. The mission of the Harris County Flood Control District is to provide flood damage reduction projects that work with appropriate regard for community and natural values. One of the most difficult challenges we face is constructing effective projects that are sensitive to community and natural values in a highly urbanized area. Harris County includes 22 main watersheds, totaling approximately 1,800 square miles and more than 2,500 linear miles of channel. 2,500 miles is approximately the distance from New York to California. Each watershed has its own unique characteristics and needs. Tonight, we're discussing the Little Cypress Creek watershed in Northwest Harris County. Our area is flood prone, and here are some reasons why. We're prone to extreme rainfall events such as hurricanes and tropical storms. We have flat, slow draining topography or landscape. And we have clay soils that do not absorb excess rainfall quickly. The Flood Control District works with other agencies and sh shared jurisdiction over flooding issues in Harris County. This slide illustrates that shared jurisdiction. Inside the neighborhoods, as shown on the left side of this illustration, Storm sewer and roadside ditches collect stormwater runoff and start the process of moving it away from streets and homes. Storm sewer and roadside ditches are the responsibility of the underlying municipality and Harris County Engineering and unincorporated parts of Harris County. The larger bodies and channel that take the stormwater and move it towards the Galveston Bay are the responsibility of the flood control district. This is shown on the right side of the illustration. In the middle, is a stormwater detention basin, sometimes constructed by the flood control district. When storm sewers are increased, this creates an increase in runoff. Since it is our policy to avoid impacts to properties downstream, detention basins help to safely take in and temporarily store excess runoff during heavy rain events. Often, we partner with Harris County precincts, utility districts, and others to add recreational amenities, such as trails to these detention basins and channels. On August 25th, 2018, Harris County voters provided $2.5 billion for bonds in bonds for flood risk reduction projects. This vote followed a series of meetings across Harris County and each watershed, which resulted in a list of a 181 bond projects, and including 14 in the Cypress Creek watershed, Little Cypress Creek watershed. 144 of those 181 projects have been initiated so far. A total of more than $680 million in partnership funding has been received so far, and that stretches the bond program even further. The actual timing of the individual projects will depend on a variety of factors, including environmental permitting, right-of-way acquisition, and utility relocations. Project lists and schedules will be updated periodically. Partnership funding is, is an important aspect of the 2018 bond program. This graphic illustrates the many sources of federal, state, and local funding that the Flood Control District is working to secure for Harris County. Each agency has its own definition of eligible projects and its own requirements for local match funding.
Now we'll move into the part of the presentation that is specifically about the Little Cypress Creek watershed and the four stormwater detention basins that are part of the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. Little Cypress Creek watershed is located in Northwest Harris County, north of 290 and ultimately drains into Cypress Creek. It is approximately 50 square miles and comprises of about 15% of the total watershed, the total Cypress Creek watershed. The upper reaches of the watershed are mostly rural and undeveloped. The goal of the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program is to provide flood risk, risk reduction to the entire watershed so that as development occurs within the watershed, the drainage infrastructure meets the standards set in place by Harris County. Accomplishing the goals of the Frontier Program will require the design and construction of new and larger capacity channels in coordination with multiple stormwater detention basin projects throughout the watershed. For reference, most of the watershed is located in Harris County Precinct 3. The downstream third of the watershed lies in Harris County Precinct 4. The Frontier Program is unique to several watersheds within Harris County. The overarching goal is to provide stormwater infrastructure ahead of development while reducing the existing risk of flooding within the watershed especially in those areas that are yet to be developed. The program has been operating under a set of interim guidelines adopted by Harris County Commissioners Court in February 2014. The development requirement in these guidelines go beyond the current standard requirements for stormwater detention bases and excavation within the watershed. As development occurs within the watershed, we are actively coordinating with developers and property owners to acquire land and property rights suitable for flood risk reduction projects. The master drainage plan for the watershed is currently being finalized to include the historic rainfall rates, such as those major events we experienced over the past three to five years. As I previously stated, development requirements within the Little Cypress Creek watershed are more stringent than within other watersheds in Harris County. Developers are required to pay $4,000 per acre for uh, impact fee for new development or redevelopment that results in an increase in impervious area. These funds are utilized to acquire right of way within the watershed for channels and stormwater detention basins. In addition to the impact fees, developers must document that their development will cause no adverse impact to others. They, they also must assist with construction of channel and stormwater detention basin projects in the watershed by excavating on flood control district's property at a rate of 0 0.89 acre feet per acre of development. It's important to note that the minimum, the current minimum requirement in other watersheds is approximately 0 0.65 acre feet per acre of development. The Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program will provide a minimum of 10 to 12 foot deep channels within the watershed to accommodate stormwater outfalls from neighborhoods and provide adequate depth within the watershed. Post construction, the proposed improvements will produce several feet of reduction in water surface elevation, reducing the overall flood risk throughout the watershed. During the master drainage plan process, computer models of the watershed were uh, updated as uh, to current conditions within the watershed and calibrated against most recent storm events. The 2016 tax day storm is still the event of record throughout most of the watershed, even when compared to Harvey. The models were calibrated to the 2016 tax day event and then validated against the Memorial Day and Harvey events. They were found to match the high water marks within about a half a foot. The master drainage plan establishes the overall plan of improvements within the watershed. Generally, the proposed improvements consist of a combination of stormwater detention basins, improved channels, and new channels. Today, we are presenting four of the detention basins in the center area of the watershed that are currently in the preliminary engineering stage of development. These include what we're calling the Hager, Shield, Muskie West, and Mason stormwater detention basins. In the following slides, I'll be sharing concept illustrations 
rather than final design plans for each of those four bases. These are conceptual drawings and are subject to change as the basic design progresses and we receive public input. This is a concept for the Hager Stormwater Detention Basin, formally identified as L500-11-00 and bond ID F-32. It's located in the most, most upstream portion of the watershed between Hager and Roberts Road. As I mentioned previously, stormwater detention bases reduce the risk of flooding by taking in and temporarily storing stormwater from the creek during heavy rain events. Then, as water levels in the creek drop after the storm event, the stormwater drains back into the creek. This layout and others you will view in this presentation generally illustrate stormwater detention basin concept. The blue lines and shapes represent channel and channels and permanent pool elevations within the stormwater detention basins. The green spaces, the green shapes, represents the future trees and vegetation locations. The Hager Basin is approximately 260 acres, and the basin itself will store approximately 1,700 acre feet of stormwater. This slide is intended to give you an idea of an acre foot of stormwater. An acre foot of stormwater, an acre foot is roughly the size of a football field from goal line to goal line, about one feet, one foot deep. This is the shield detention basin, L500-09-00 and bond ID F-30. It is located south of Bowhawkey Road and on both sides of Bow Road. The shield basin is approximately 582 acres and will store approximately 6,300 to 6,800 acre feet of stormwater detention. As you can see, this basin also includes multiple compartments with permanent pools. These pools are planted with special vegetation that will help improve the stormwater quality as it passes through the basin. They offer other important environmental benefits such as habitat for wildlife and give the basins a more natural appearance. This is the Muskie West Stormwater Detention Basin, L500-10-00 and bond ID F-31. It is located south of Bowerhockey Road and just west of Muskie Road. The Muskie West Basin site is approximately 190 acres and was approximately 1,100 acres of stormwater. We are often asked whether, whether permanent pools subtract from the capacity of a stormwater detention basin. Actually, these pools are below the natural water table. The basin storage area consists of the space between the natural water table surface and the top of banks of the basin. This is the Mason Stormwater Detention Basin, L512-03-00, and bond ID F-34. It is located north of Bowhockey Road, just inside the Grand Parkway. The Mason Basin site is approximately 200 acres and will store approximately 1,900 acre feet of stormwater. Now we will discuss what the next steps are for the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. In the near future, for the near future of the Frontier Program, it is focused on finalizing the Master Drainage Plan report to include a new rainfall as developed as part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Atlas 14 effort. The final Master Drainage Plan report should be complete this fall 2020. When the report is adopted, the interim Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program guidelines will be finalized. Property acquisition will continue as available funding allows. And as development continues to occur within the Little Cypress Creek watershed, developers will continue to be a part of the overall frontier program. Each of these bases within the Little Cypress Creek frontier program follows a typical project life cycle illustrated here. Each of these four bases is going through a separate preliminary engineering process. Community input will be considered as the preliminary engineering report is completed and prepared for presentation to the Harris County Commissioner's Court in winter of 2020 2021. After those reports are approved, each basin will begin a design stage in 2021 
and that could take approximately two to three years. And that depends on the basin, uh, the timeline for federal environmental permitting. Pending available funding for each basin, construction will follow and is expected to take several years. Thank you, Marcus, for that helpful overview of this project. Before we go into the Q&A session tonight, I'd like to share just a quick reminder with you that we would love to hear from you on this project and other projects that are rolling out across Harris County. If you have any additional comments or questions throughout the life cycle of this project, or if you'd like to sign up to receive email updates on this and other projects in the watershed, please visit hcfcd.org forward slash F26. Community engagement is an important component of the work we do, and we invite your continued participation as projects move forward. Now, as a reminder, there are three ways to submit a comment about this project during tonight's session. You can submit a comment on this site in the box near the presentation live stream, submit a comment on the Flood Control District's website at hcfcd.org forward slash F26, or submit a comment via phone at 855-925-2801, utilizing meeting code 9652. If you're joining us via phone tonight, please press star three to leave a message. Additionally, I want to reiterate that any questions not addressed during tonight's Q&A will receive a response from the Flood Control District after the event. Information from this meeting and a recording of the live stream will be available on the Flood Control District's website and our YouTube channel. Joining Marcus for our Q&A session tonight is Erwin Burden, manager of the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program, who is overseeing efforts in these four basins. So we'll now take some of your questions and move to the Q&A portion of this meeting. We'll send our first question to Marcus, and it is from... Paul Fabian, he says that it's great to see work being done upstream of Longwood, as well as the repairs to Longwood Trace, but there is a large amount of debris in Little Cypress Creek in the Longwood area. What are your plans to clean things up? Uh, thank you for the question, Paul. And uh, we actually encourage residents that uh, if they report, if they notice blockages within the channel to uh, report those through our Citizen Service Center. Uh, and then that can be found on the hcfc.org slash contact us website or by calling our um, hotline at 346-286-4197. Uh, but as, as this project uh, moves forward, uh, we expect that we'll clear those blockages as we start to do the improvements for each one of the basins. So as time goes on and these projects start to develop or these uh, basins start to develop, we'll work on those blockages. However, again, if there are any immediate concerns, then you contact, contact us through the website or just give us a call. All right, thank you, Marcus. The next question is for Erwin. It's from Richard Bird. Wants to know about the environmental impact studies that have been done relative to this project and where um, where are the findings? Well, we, we're working on the uh, uh, cultural uh, wetland delineations, and we're looking at the reviewing the core jurisdictional channels. Uh, we're looking at endangered species, and uh, we also do bird surveys during the course of these projects. Um, most of the results of this, uh, some of it will be referenced in the PER once this is finished. So the life cycle of that will be the we were waiting. We've been working on this PER for months. We were we want to get your and in, your input from the uh, from these from these projects for this meeting, and then we'll try to finalize those PERs through the end of the year. And uh, once they uh, are adopted, they'll be posted on our website. Um, as for the reports, some of them won't be completely finished and verified by the core until we get well into design, because um, we'll have to work with the the core to uh, adjust them as necessary. So. The actual reports uh, won't be ready for a while, but we will be referencing parts of them in the PER. All right, thank you. Thank you, Erwin. Our next question will be for Marcus, and that is how can a basin with water at the bottom hold more water during a storm event? 
Okay. <laughs> and that's actually a good question. Thank you for that one. Um, I'll, I'll try to explain this as, as best I can. Um, so as, as we dig deeper into the ground, uh, you eventually encounter a water table. So uh, in previous years, that's where most of our drinking water came from. It came from us uh, sticking pumps in the ground and pumping out groundwater. So we're digging down to that groundwater. And that's actually the wet portion of the basin that we show on some of the exhibits that you see uh, in front of you. So, and so creating that storage just because it's wet at the bottom. So the volume that we're calculating that I mentioned in the presentation actually goes from where we start to see that natural water table to where natural ground is. So that's how we we're able to store water in an area that already contains water during the storm event. Good information. Thank you, Marcus. This next question is for Irwin. Where, and it's from Lance Jordan, will there be public walking trails along these basins? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, we've been working with uh, Precinct 3 and other entities to uh, uh, sponsor. The district doesn't build them, but we've been working, engaged with uh, the precinct. Uh, very closely, both three and four, for um, providing a shelf or locations for trails to be constructed as part of the projects as kind of a joint use area. And so, yes, uh, trails will be uh, accounted or will be accommodated uh, where we have sponsors to build them. Thanks, Erwin. Also, I um, wanted to get in a couple questions in about the impact to trees. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, impact to trees along Little Cypress Creek through lakes of Fairhaven, including the east side of Mason Road? Yes, we, uh, we've we been working with the lakes of Fairhaven very closely to uh, um, alter the design, just like uh, this, this meeting is meant to uh, include public involvement and comment. Um, we received some comments from the lakes of Fairhaven. We've been engaged in conversations on how we can best save the trees uh, along Little Cypress Creek, and we, we're coming up with a, a relatively good plan moving forward, although we're still in conceptual stages. So uh, what we do is we look at all of our basins, just like the basin projects, we look at where we can save some trees. Uh, if there's a really nice, um, healthy species, we will definitely try to work, the, work those into design. However, um, there are going to be some trees removed to construct the project. So, um, but we do work with, uh, the community and the uh, uh, the 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 uh, subdivisions and and HOAs along the route to see what we uh, can save and 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 protect the trees. Erwin, just a follow up question uh, from Jim Robertson: How much of the acreage? How much of the acreage required for these four basins has been purchased? Uh, well, it's unique to each each basin. Um, uh, three of the basins uh, here, the Shield Basin, we've we've actually acquired the entire basin. So we have all the real estate for the footprint of the basin. Uh, the channel sections leading downstream, we're still working on a couple of tracks there. Um, and we're working still with an agreement with Lakes of Fairhaven to, for their part as well. Um, as for the other three basins, we've acquired a little piece of each one of them. And we have uh, several of them in, um, uh, in our real property division in various uh, stages of closing on track. So uh, we could have a, a significant amount of real estate uh, for almost all of these four basins in the next six to eight months. Thank you, Erwin. We'll, we'll give you a break here in just a second, but uh, we did wanna ask if you could go back a little bit and kind of talk about the history of the Frontier Program. Well, the, the district has been working on the frontier programs in general for over, probably over 20 years. Uh, there's some other uh, programs, uh, sister programs to the Little Cypress Creek, like Langham. Um, Little Cypress Creek um, actually uh, had started before I got to the district and they um, passed the interim guidelines in 2014. And that really started the big push of the effort you see today because uh, we, that, um, provided a requirement for developers to actually participate in the program to get their permits. So once that occurred, and then of course in 2018, um, the uh, citizens graciously uh, uh, approved a bond program, which actually infused some money in the program, which actually further pushed it along. So um, those are the two big pieces. 
Uh, we've been working on a master plan. Uh, we adopted the first one back in 2018 during the uh, turmoil between uh, the tax day storms, the Memorial Day storms, and just before Harvey. And then um, Harvey happened and we've had to reevaluate it again to include to increase to the new design criteria that the county has adopted post Harvey. So with that said, uh, the, the basins have been moving forward. We've been acquiring right away. Uh, the development is picking up quite significantly. And, uh, and we have had reports that uh, there has been significant uh, reductions observed by uh, some of the residents downstream. Thank you, Irwin. Uh, this next question will be for Marcus from Marley Allen. Wanted to know if after a after the property acquisition, will the county mow and ma maintain the property? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, once we acquire the, uh, the properties, uh, we do try to uh, attempt to maintain them. For the most part, uh, a lot of it is going to depend on whether or not. Uh, we already have a developer that's lined up for the site. So um, if we, we purchased uh, some acreage and it, were, it was all trees right now and we didn't have a developer uh, prepared to go out to that site, we, we don't intend on clearing the site uh, uh, until we get someone on board to actually do the, the excavation work that we want. Okay, Marcus, thank you. Erwin, can you talk a little bit about the bird survey that will take place? Yes, uh, the district is required to, uh, during the uh, uh, nesting seasons, we're required by law, by the state law, to actually do a bird sa survey to make sure that any clearing does not uh, displace uh, the nested birds. The district actually does those uh, uh, bird surveys year round just to ensure that we are in total compliance with that requirement. So. Uh, we do them year round prior to any clearing. It could be clearing for uh, development. It could be clearing for uh, um, working on the, you know, acquiring surveys and geotech for the, the projects in these basins. And it can also be for actual starting a construction. So uh, those bird saver surveys are very important to us. Thank you, Erwin. Marcus, can we talk a little bit about how this uh, program fits into the bond program, how this project fits? Uh, yes, so you know the, the the entire intent of the bond program was to give uh, flood control 2.5 billion dollars to uh, to do flood damage reduction projects, and so as for Little Cypress Creek uh, specifically, uh, nine basins came out of that bond program, uh, totaling uh, approximately 165 million dollars of the 2.5 billion. Uh, we identified about $20 million in partnership funding for that. Uh, so uh, just to give you an idea, uh, flood control typically operated uh, with $60 million for capital improvement projects. So that's two and a half times the total that we have in the bond to actually uh, keep this Little Cypress Creek uh, Frontier Program moving forward. Whereas before, um, this project would have had to complete compete with several other projects for that $60 million in CIP um, as, as we plan out our program. And of course, with the, with the way things are, uh, with having such a limited budget, it would depend on sort of a, a, a worse first or, or where we can get the, the, the better use of, our, of the $60 million for that one year uh, over uh, a budget a fiscal year, I'm sorry. Thanks, Marcus. I'll also ask a, a follow up. Why doesn't every watershed have a program like the Frontier Program? Uh, so the the Frontier Program, again, because most of Harris County is developed, the western por portion of Harris County is the least developed, and you know we're starting to see the trends of more development coming in on, on the west side. And so to prevent us from making some of maybe the same mistakes we made 50, 60 years ago, uh, and allowing all the development to come in before we actually get a hold on the drainage. Uh, this program, as well as another program we have, were created to make sure that we're out in front of development and that development does not create a, a flooding situation or, or make things worse for, for those people that live in those areas. Thank you, Marcus. The next question is for Irwin. Uh, why is it important to validate and calibrate against different rain events? Well, that's a good question. The uh, um, what we do is we used uh, several um, 
known storm events. We tried to use the largest of record, uh, like tax day. Uh, we looked at both the Memorial Days and uh, Harvey, and we actually uh, verified with actual um, water. We went out and measured the actual high water marks during those storms, and we used that information to actually simulate that in our hydraulic models to model the watershed. And as Mark has mentioned earlier, we got those um, the model within half a foot of most of the locations. And um, so we got an extremely good model to, to actually repeat. And so when we uh, when Harvey actually happened, we actually simulated the rainstorm event in the model and it actually, ver actually uh, verified the elevations of water surface we, we actually re we saw when we did the high water marks. Good deal. Um, another question for you, Erwin. Eric Johnson wants to know, will the areas along the existing creek, not the detention basin areas, be left as natural green spaces? Um, in most areas, we're going to have to deepen the channel because one of the issues with uh, Little Cypress Creek is the channels just aren't, are, when you get past Grand Parkway, they get shallow really, really quick. And by the time you get to Becker Road, they're almost non-existent. So, um, we've had to, we have to go through Little Cypress Creek and actually deepen it. So we're deepening the channel, uh, most of the watershed, uh, some degree. And so, um, where we can, we try to widen it to one side or the other. Um, but we still have to keep the sinuosity and to, to make these self compensating projects with the US Corps of, Ar or US Corps of US Army Corps of Engineers. So what we're doing is we're actually going to have to remove some trees. We'll keep what we can and keep it natural. But in a lot of locations like Becker uh, Road, where the Zuby Park area is, and we have a Zuby Basin, that, that basin actually um, was so densely forested, it actually had an extreme erosion problems during every storm event. And uh, after we get through, the water quality will be, on, will be fairly clear most of the time, and the erosion will be reduced, and you'll actually have a better natural environment and we are do we are still saving a lot of the trees in the in the project area. So uh, it'll be a nice blend, a little thinner, where you can actually enjoy the trees and enjoy the environment. Thank you, Erwin. I, I do want to uh, give a quick statement. We're getting a lot of questions about specific neighborhoods, and we want to make sure that we're sharing information that is relevant to our full audience tonight. So um, as a reminder, we'll follow up after tonight's meeting to address those specific questions. Erwin, we'll go back to you. A resident of the Cypress Creek watershed wants to know, how does this project help the Cypress Creek watershed? Well, the project, uh, the program overall is to uh, uh, have a net reduction in water surface elevations and uh, discharge on, on Cypress Creek. So um, the goal was to have a noticeable reduction in discharge. So the overall um, impact to Little Cypress Creek is it doesn't have an impact. Uh, we are also working diligently with Cypress Creek to partner on several projects to actually in, increase the effects of, uh, of this project on the effects of other projects already work, we're working on in, in Cypress Creek. So uh, the answer to that is gonna be more in the Cypress Creek program because they're actually producing a model to model the effect of both but we are, um, we're working together as a partner, even internally on projects to, uh, to get the best benefit for the community. Thank you, Erwin. This next question is from Marcus from Michael Weinstein. How are you preventing erosion? Um, how are you preventing erosion in the, with this project? Uh, so so uh, most of the options that we're looking at for this project includes uh, what we refer to as uh, natural stable channel design. And what that does is it creates a, a, a low flow uh, sinusoidal channel at the bottom portion of the, the channel segments that we're creating. So that it, it allows for uh, some of that area to grow back into a natural state and uh, reduce velocities uh, whenever you have your, your smaller storm events. So natural stable channel design is one of those ways that we're, we're trying to, that where we should fix some of the erosion problems that we see along with Cypress Creek. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, here's another one for you from Lisa Foley. Is there a risk of bond money being reallocated to other watersheds and Cypress Creek work being abandoned and or current projects left incomplete? Uh, and so, the well, 
as of right now, all of the funds that we have for the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program are intended for the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program. And there are no current plans to move any funds right now from uh, one uh, watershed to another. Now, uh, there, there is always a potential for that, but that's just not part of the plan right now. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, next question for Irwin. Lance Jordan is asking if there is an estimated construction timeline schedule yet for each basin, um, and does each one have a separate schedule? Uh, good question. Um, yes, each project has its own um, independent schedule, and uh, some of them are linked by the actual permitting that we get from the core eventually. So uh, most of these projects, it will take um, a good six months to a year to do final design once the P and the preliminary engineering report is completed. And, um, and then we'll have to submit it to the core for the permit. And that'll take at least 18 months to get that permit. So, um, most of the time frame that uh, we're waiting on is actually waiting on getting the permit. So once we get the permit, we'll build the final plans and then, and then work toward construction. And Marcus, I'll follow up with you on that. Why do these projects, um, Take so long. Can you talk a little bit more about the timeline? Uh, yeah, so the, the reason that, you know, most projects will take up and we're assuming that everything goes perfect from, um, from the idea of being thrown out by residents or from us developing a plan would take probably about six to seven years. And that's because uh, you have a feasibility phase and that takes, you know, you figuring out, can you really do this project uh, with the amount of funds that you have. And from there, you move into your uh, preliminary engineering phase. Uh, that's where you do all of your environmental uh, surveys, your topographic surveys, your subsurface utility investigations, and, and all of these things to, to make sure that you do your due diligence so that when you are prepared to design the project that you don't encounter something that you didn't expect and then all of a sudden a a $10 million project becomes a $20 million project. And it's, it's just a common life cycle for, for any project. And again, even if everything went perfectly on every single project, you'd be looking at five to seven years before you actually see anything in the ground. Gotcha. Marcus, can you um, talk a little bit more to, um, you, you mentioned the basins earlier, but can you talk more about um, wet bottom versus dry bottom? Uh, yes, yeah, so a, a wet bottom basin is where we excavate down to the natural water table and then add some additional, dig out a little bit more to uh, make sure we get uh, good water quality. And uh, a wet bottom basin typically provides more detention volume than a dry bottom. And the reason for that is, well, if you have a, a water surface elevation, it's it's flat. However, if you... Uh, you do a dry bottom basin, you have to make sure that you meet certain grades. So certain portions of the basin needs to be a little bit higher than the other. And that takes away from your effective volume because you have to make it drain. So wet bottom basins just produce more volume than dry bottom. Thanks, Marcus. This next question is for Irwin from Matthew Stallman is asking, what is the expected wetland and stream mitigation plan to satisfy the Corps permit? Well, that's really, that's that's a loaded question in some degree. Um, the, the plan we have right now is we actually identify wetlands on the property, the project footprint, and then we actually uh, pay for those credits where the district already has them in the, uh, uh, some of our wetland banks. So uh, we actually mitigate by uh, paying for this, the wetland credits in our banks, the stream credits are a lot more difficult to do. And so we're using the natural stable channel design process that Marcus was mentioning earlier to make these self uh, compensating channels. When the way we do that is the channels actually become longer and a healthier uh, system once we're finished. And the core has to review all that and approve the concept. And then they, they come out and inspect the final product. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, here's a follow up question. When people, when will people be able to see the design details for these basins? And if you can explain the difference of where we are now in the prelim uh, versus design. Well, that's a good question too. Uh, we, we actually are meeting we had in 2018 
um, had several basins in it, and uh, uh, two, uh, one of the projects is going to advertise tomorrow. Uh, uh, yeah, so Zuby Basin is going to advertise tomorrow for phase three. Uh, the club, the, the Bauer Hockley Basin in that one is actually finishing up construction now, be finished by the end of the year. And uh, the Club Woods Basin in that group is actually going to bid and uh, within the next month. So um, there's three of the basins and you can actually go online. Um, you can look at the website and uh, go online and actually pull a set of plans yourself and look at the drawings for Zuby and Club will be there in a week or two. Um, if you want the other ones, you can uh, do requests, and I'm sure we can provide uh, drawings on a digital copy uh, of the Bauer Hockley plans. It's phase one. Um, these other projects, as we work forward, um, we'll we'll have them available at different times whenever they're they're completed. All right, thank you, Erwin and Marcus. We'll send it uh, send it back over to you. Um, I wanted to talk some more too about. Um, the sort of the timeline and, um, you know, you mentioned some of these projects, the timeline is, is a five year window. Right, and so, so again, as I, as I mentioned previously, the, the five year window, again, assumes that everything goes really well. <clears throat> your, your survey, for example, would take you, you know, 60 days, depending on whether or not you have uh, good weather. And then you start incorporating the modeling for the preliminary engineering and all of the other field investigations that need to take place. Those things can take you up to a year itself. Um, the for the design process, you know, you going back and re-verifying what you've done for the preliminary engineering, that could take you another, you know, year or so for that. And then you add on top of that the feasibility study, which is also about another year. So that gives you three years there and you assume at least one year for construction. Um, I, I was throwing out five years because if, if something happens in between that, you give yourself an extra year. But typically five years is about, or five to seven years is about what we say. And that again, that doesn't include running into some a major environmental permitting issue or uh, running into an acquisition of right-of-way issue, which, which we experience a lot of, uh, for this particular uh, watershed and for the Little Cypress Creek Frontier Program, because uh, if you don't have a willing seller, then you get involved in condemnations and it just takes time to, to, for you to be able to do any real work uh, in order to progress the project. Thanks, Marcus. We're also we're getting a couple of questions concerned about erosion. Can we talk a little bit more about what is done to to um, to help with erosion? And so the the erosion issues that are being experienced right now is just because the uh, just the channel is just naturally taking its course and the, the soil types that are within the area. And so that's what's creating the issue by doing the natural stable channel designs. This should allow us to be able to, to better control the, uh, the flow that's experienced, give us an opportunity to lay the slopes back so that we don't have such steep slopes and give the, the water some a gradual path to flow through as opposed to where it, where it is now, where if you have a, an extremely deep bend without something to control the velocities at a lower elevation, then uh, you're gonna see um, a much larger erosion um, and, and failures. Thanks, Marcus. We do want to let you know that um, you can still send us your comments in on the project page and those questions that we don't get a chance to talk about tonight. We will follow up with you on those. Um, we'll go to Erwin. Can you talk more about the global view in terms of um, how many um, acre feet of storage will be added to the watershed at the end of the day? Well, there's two answers for that. With the four basins you're, we're talking about tonight, we're going to be adding about 12,000 acre feet of storage. Um, and uh, with the whole program, when all the basins are built out, we're, our target storage is closer to 20,000 acre feet. Um, the Shield Basin, in reference to all that, is targeted to hold 6,000 acre feet by itself, which will be the largest stormwater retention basin the district currently owns. Um, benefit fit with the completed and future planned work? Well, once these basins are online, um, uh, development digs out more most of the volume. So 
Um, don't get me wrong, it won't be completed for some time, but once they're on online and they're actually functioning, um, we should you should start seeing immediate um, effects downstream because we have an ENR and the shield basin has been operating for about four or five years, and we have a significant uh, volume already established. Same thing with the Bauer Hockley Basin. There's a significant storage already established there. And we've already removed a significant storage in the Zuby Basin as well. So when those came on, when that one came online last year uh, or two years ago, uh, it actually already started uh, reducing flooding in a neighboring subdivision. So um, you should see effects fairly uh, quickly once the basins are um, put online, meaning the control structures are installed. And then as the volume increases with development and our ENR contractors or excavation removal contractors, the, uh, the effects will increase over time. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, Marcus, we'll go back to you for some folks who joined us late. Can you go back through the project overviews for us? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so specifically what we're talking about tonight are four stormwater detention basins. Um, these four basins are, uh, and let's see, I guess we can start with the, the Hagar Basin, which is on the left side here, the left and at the top. The, the, Hagar, ba the Hagar Basin uh, is approximately 260 acres. Um, that will account for about 1,700 acre feet of detention storage that we are expecting. Uh, the moving further to the to the right, to, I guess to the middle. Okay, we we're not on that exhibit. That's fine. And we also have the Shield Basin, which is uh, about 582 acres. Uh, that accounts for about 6,300 to 6,800. Um, acre feet of stormwater detention basin. We'll better refine that number once we move into the uh, the design phase. Uh, we also have the let's see the Mason Basin or Musky West. That's fine. So the Musky West Basin um, is about 190 acres and accounts for about 1,100 acre feet of storage water of uh, storage stormwater. And finally, the Mason Basin which is a uh, approximately 200 plus or minus acres and about 1900 acre feet of stormwater uh, detention. So you know, a lot of, we, we have a lot of uh, planned detention for each one of these sites and I think it'll, it's, it's gonna uh, benefit the community well. Thanks, Marcus. Can we talk a little bit about how these um, sites were selected or a little bit more? Uh, and I'll pass that one to Erwin. Thank you. Um, the uh, basins were selected uh, by a combination of, uh, of concerns. We uh, we looked at the floodplains, the map floodplains currently, because obviously that's an area that's uh, already subject to flooding. And then we started following contour lines, meaning elevations that are uh, uh, equal elevation or uh, parts of land that are equal in elevation, meaning like a tabletop. We followed the line around to see how it uh, intersect, uh, intersected so we could look at uh, how we would pool the water. And um, we tried to um, work toward the uh, real estate that was, or the land that was uh, more subject to flooding and less desirable to develop or to, uh, to, to utilize for other resource, other uses. And uh, that's how we picked these basins. Um, and we also looked at where we needed it as well as the, the third component to see how effective it would be at those locations. And between all that, that's how we, we set the, the footprint. And then we looked at available acreage that we could acquire. Thank you, Erwin. Uh, I do wanna remind everyone that there are three ways that you can comment on tonight's session. You can go uh, submit a comment on this site in the box near the presentation live stream. You can submit a comment on the Flood Control District's website at hcfcd.org forward slash F26. Um, additionally, any comments that we don't get to tonight, we will follow up. We'll go back to uh, we'll go back to Irwin. Can you talk a little bit about the issues there are of working on a, a natural channel? Um, the natural channel has, you know, the, the issues that we get into most is um, uh, it's also it's obviously a um, there's a habitat so uh, there's fish habitat there's a uh, um, animal habitat there's bird habitat of different types 
And so uh, we have to look at that and we have to look at erosion issues. We look at soil types. Uh, the soil types in Little Cypress Creek, for the most part, are very dispersive, is what we call it, which means that it melts. Basically, you can take a lump of soil and put it in a glass of water, and it just melts to the bottom of the, the bottom of the glass. So, um, which means that it erodes really, really easily and very quickly. And uh, anyone that lives along the creek would know there's quite significant amounts of sand and, and material going down the creek during the major flood events. Um, so what we do is we have to work on features that actually stabilize that and reduce that erosion. Um, and we're using natural components. So uh, we're actually harvesting some of the trees that, you, that you're concerned with, and we're using the stumps to actually reinforce the channel, and they're called uh, uh, log veins. And so we use log veins and root balls and stuff like that to actually armor the, the channel naturally and uh, help reduce those erosion and, and keep the channel from cutting uh, into into the higher banks. So um, does that answer your question? I believe so. <laughs> can you tell talk about um, how developers can participate in the Frontier program or how do they participate? Uh, the developers are, requ are required to, uh, uh, when they build their project, they have to have uh, detention requirements by the, the county requirements. In this watershed, uh, it's normally uh, 0.55 acre feet per acre. In this watershed, they're actually doing 0.89. Um, and uh, I think that may have been updated updated late recently to 0.65 by the county. But anyway, it's it, they have to do 0.89 acre feet per acre in this watershed. And what that does is allows for the extra depth of the channels and the uh, volume that has to be stored in the basins. And they have to dig that volume in our real estate, in our right of ways and channels. And we actually work with them on the permitting process, and we actually establish the excavation locations in a planned, uh, coordinated um, uh, event to where uh, the detention is actually a, as effective as it possibly can at the day they dig it. And uh, so they are required to dig that as, as each development occurs. Thanks, Darwin. Um, over to Marcus. How does maintenance work once these are developed? Uh, so, so what we will do, uh, since these are wet bottom basins with uh, stormwater quality features, uh, we will make sure that we're going out uh, periodically and making sure that the, the wetland plantings that are planted are uh, healthy and, and um, serve their, their purpose. Um, in terms of, of mowing, uh, what, you're, what you'll likely see is uh, because we're doing um, natural stable channel designs, uh, we have what's called a riparian buffer. So that's going to be an area that uh, that we don't technically, that we don't really mow. Uh, we let it go back to nature so it can start to stabilize. But uh, on the higher bank portions of the channel, it would be, it would function like any other uh, channel or detention basin that we have in Harris County. So we'll have uh, three mowing cycles on it. And again, the wetland plantings and all of that stormwater quality uh, features will be, be maintained as needed. Good information. Thank you, Marcus. Over to Irwin. Uh, why haven't these sites been developed as stormwater detention basins until now? Uh, funding. Uh, we didn't have, uh, until the bond was passed, we didn't have the, the funding to move forward with the right-of-way acquisition. Um, and so once we got the, the money to get the acquisition, we also... Uh, brought the consultants on board to start to design, work in the preliminary engineering reports, and uh, uh, start doing the geotech, environmental assessments, and all that information so we can actually address um, the, the Corps of Engineers and address the, uh, the criteria of the design projects. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, Marcus, over to you. A uh, question from Eric Johnson is asking, what is the best guess as to when construction would start? Uh, that's okay, so let's see. So best guess uh, with us being at the end of preliminary engineering uh, and expecting to wrap this up and going into design design at the beginning of 2021, uh, then I would add about another nine months there for design, nine months to a year. Uh, bidding the contract out and awarding it would put us uh, probably early 2022. All right. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we're going to ask Erwin about uh, geotechnical 
boring samples. Um, this is being done near someone's home and they want to know what they're for. That's that's an important question. Um, the um, to give you an example, um, the slope of the channels um, normally in the years past, we required a minimum of three to one slope, which is for every uh, vertical foot, you would go three feet out. And that was how you establish that slope. Um, um, we have actually standardized, we like four to one slopes most of the time because they're a lot easier to mow. You can actually walk them down, uh, walk up and down a three to one slope, uh, relatively easy, not simple, but relatively easy. Uh, but out in this watershed, this, uh, the soils are so dispersive that we've actually had to make most of the basins five to ones. And in some locations, we've actually had to go to six to one slopes. And to give you an idea of a six to one slope, if you're driving down uh, most of the highways in the state of Texas or farm market roads, and you see the slope that's leaving the edge of pavement down to the low ditch, that's a six to one slope. It's established by TxDOT, uh, so you can actually correct your vehicle without rolling it to get back up on the pavement if you leave the road. Um, that slope is in most locations in Little Cypress Creek is the only slope we have that's stable enough to not cause erosion almost instantly. So uh, we're using a lot of five to one slopes and six to one slopes to prevent the erosion problems um, due to the, the dispersive soils that, that we got, that we actually got the information on the geotech report. And we've actually had to modify some of the designs of these basins in the last six months to a year once these reports came in. Um, Erwin, can you tell us just sort of the overall benefit to these four basins? Um, well, the benefits are, are going to be the, they take the, uh, the uh, well, one thing is, is we allow, it allows us to have enough real estate to actually do a very nice meandering channel to get the natural stable channel design permits. Um, so that's one benefit of these, of these, uh, these basins because the channels go through them. Uh, the other reason is that they hold stormwater and actually peak the discharge off. So a, a good example is during the tax day storm, a wave, you know, a lot of water hit Little Cypress Creek. It was actually one of the worst hit areas. And um, that water came down the channel unthrottled and uh, literally went down through the watershed and, and flooded quite a few homes. Uh, as these basins come online, they will, will put the control structures in there to reduce that peak discharge and actually bring them down to a, a discharge rate that we can actually manage through the channel systems we're constructing and reducing a lot of the floodplains and uh, reducing repetitive losses and flooding of homes. All right, and for our last question, it'll be for Marcus from Marley, uh, for Marie rather, Allen. Will completion of this project alter the 100 and 500 year levels for insurance? Uh, completion of the of these projects will not. Uh, we are, we are cur currently going through a uh, map next effort, uh, which takes in, into account the uh, new rainfall data that included the uh, the large storms that we've had over the past three to five years. But uh, th those that remapping is what will take into account these basins, and and that's where you'll see the benefit or, or, or reduced risk of flooding based on the FEMA floodplain maps. Thank you, Marcus. And with that, I'd like to share one final reminder that we are continuing to accept comments and feedback on this project uh, through the comment period through the 20th, but we welcome engagement through the duration of the project's life cycle. Thanks to Marcus and Irwin for giving us such great answers on those questions. And we wanna thank you again for joining us this evening and for your engagement with this project. We look forward to continuing to share updates as we move forward. Stay safe and have a good evening.